Here's an interesting statistic. The number of total knee replacements has tripled from 1993 until 2009. More and more of you and your family members are going to be getting total knee replacements sometime in the future. Chances are the man that we're gonna be talking to today taught some of the people who are gonna be performing those surgeries. Dr. Robert Booth is here with us today and he is one of the premier knee replacement surgeons in the United States, if not the world. Welcome, doctor. Thank you, Heather. I want to know, given all of that, how do you find the time to call? I know that you call all of your patients the night before surgery to make sure that they're comfortable with going in. Why do you make the time to do that? It's, it was, it's concierge medicine before it was invented. Uh, but I, I only operate on people I like or think I'd like, and I want them to be comfortable. I know that the fear of what's to come, despite classes and education and all that, to hear the voice of the person you're going to have a relationship with is very important. And it is a relationship. There's an old or an old surgical saying that if you cut them, you marry them. And so <laughs> I view it that way. I give every patient my home phone number because I want them to feel that they will have somebody with them, not just a one-time impersonal experience, especially since we're doing a lot of surgeries and people go home the same day now. We don't have that relationship that we used to have. So. Let's talk a little bit first about knee arthritis and just tell us what knee arthritis is, what it looks like on x-rays and why it's causing us so much pain that so many people have to have this surgery. There are probably a hundred different types of arthritis, rheumatoid, gout, pseudo gout, the immune diseases, lupus, etc. But the vast majority of it is what's called degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis. And it really just represents the wearing away of the cartilage that coats the bones. The bones may be fine, but the cartilage coating that you see on uh, the smooth white uh, surface, when that's eroded, then the bones rub on one another and that produces pain and swelling and stiffness and all the complaints that uh, so many of us are aware of. Um, this is an x-ray, for instance, of a patient with a healthy knee and an arthritic knee. And you can see in the healthy knee, there's still what appears to be a space between the bones. Mm -hmm. Now this person's in her 50s, so this is probably less space than she had as a teenager, but there's still a coating there. Here on the symptomatic knee, you can see that it's bone on bone. And that's what the arthritis is all about, and that's what hurts. Her bones are okay, but she's lost that. And 85% of the world wears out the inner side of their knee and gets bow-legged. About 10%, most of whom are women, wear out the outer side of their knee and get knock-kneed. Um, and then there are occasional people like this who can't make up their mind and have one of, <laughs> one so of each. So this is one patient with one of each. One of each. So uh, you see that occasionally. So... Tell me what is it is that you do during the surgery? What you essentially do in a knee replacement is put on a new surface. It's like retreading your car tires rather than putting on a whole new wheel. So you'll trim about a quarter inch of bone off the surface of the femur and put a metal cap over that. And then we trim about a half inch of bone off the lower part and put in a piece of metal and plastic. So I mean, is the femur is the thigh bone? That's the femur's top. the thigh the bone. Tibia, this is the shin bone. And so really we've only taken away a little bit of bone, just enough to accommodate these parts, which are like a resurfacing of the bone. And then most people, at least in the United States, put a little plastic button underneath the kneecap so that when you bend your knee, uh, the bone of the kneecap doesn't uh, rub on the metal but it's all held together by your ligaments. You can mix and match the sizes, right? Yes. The tops and the bottoms. And, and why do you do that? When I first did knees, we had three different sizes, small, medium, and large. So you made the people fit the parts. And then we realized that there's a huge range of anatomic differences, like women's bathing suits. So you can, we have a dozen tops and maybe uh, nine or 10 bottoms on the current system we're using so that we can match your anatomy and your size within a millimeter or two, which is far more precise than it ever was. None of these is an actual anatomic reproduction of a knee. They're still mechanical devices. They're still symmetrical. Your bones are asymmetrical. 
because the more like a natural knee it becomes, the harder it is for the surgeon to put it in correctly. You invented some of the parts that go into some of these knees. I've been lucky with a lot of other people to work on half a dozen knee systems over the years. Um, and the one we're working on now literally has two millimeter increments on the top and one millimeter increments on the bottom. So when you consider the thickness of a saw, of a saw blade is like three millimeters, it means that it's, and these are still put in by and large with manual tools. Very few joints are put in by robots or devices. It's a still a manual skill. And it really should be because the most important thing is getting the ligaments balanced properly. You can put the parts in on the bones, but unless the ligaments are balanced, the knee will be unstable. And that's actually worse than having the parts crooked or not fit. And is that why we've talked about this before? This is an art and not just a science. So far, it is still more, more art than science, I think. Something I find fascinating is that you've created a different knee for women. But the reality is that your knee is a little more delicate. It's a little more trapezoidal. The amount of bone in the front is less than it is in, the, in, a, in my knee, in a male knee. If you looked at the end of it, it would be, as I said, trapezoidal, where my knee would be more boxy and square. And it's also set at a different angle. If you put your arm out straight, you'll notice that your elbow is at an angle. Mm -hmm. Men's arms are dead straight. Oh, oh, so if yeah. you were to take a neutral example, if you were designing an elbow for a woman, you'd set it at a slight angle, mm -hmm. which is how these knees are, are created. But now there are Saudi Arabian knees, there are Asian knees, there are, if the Asians, for instance, have a very boxy square uh, shaped knee, and they don't do as well with the standard ones. So there are knees now made for ethnicities, for gender. What other ways has total knee replacement changed, and do, do you see it going in the future? The materials have changed a little bit. The tops are still chrome cobalt steel, and the bottom's titanium, although allergy is now becoming a big issue nickel allergy specifically in America, again, mostly in women. And so there are a lot of materials that have changed. The instruments are better. We're on the cusp of using robotic type tools and computers. The problem is that the high volume surgeons who can afford these things or whose hospitals can afford these fancy tools don't need them because they've got the skill in their brain to do it. And the low volume surgeons who may help be benefited by these don't have the volume to justify it through their hospital. Probably the biggest change, however, is none of those things, but rather pain management. Uh, that's one of the big issues with a the knee. There are a lot of nerves in your knee, um, and next to your hand and a couple other organs, it's probably the most sensitive areas of your body. And so there are several new drugs now. One is uh, sort of a super strength Novocaine, if you will, that will stay in your knee for two or three days. Um, we've learned to use intravenous Tylenol, which doesn't sound very impressive because Tylenol is basically a weak pain drug, but intravenously it's stronger than morphine and you don't get any of the narcotic side effects. No addiction issues? Or no addiction wow, issues. Wow, that's great. That. You can only give it intravenously in the hospital. But, and the, I think the biggest concept, and this is embarrassing, frankly, as a surgeon, is that we used to operate on people and then we'd sit and watch them, and when they started to scream, we'd give them pain medication. Right. Now we know they're going to scream, so there's a pre-medication package that everybody's given now. Uh, multimodal medications, it's called. So there's something for pain, there's something for inflammation, uh, one of the anti-inflammatory drugs. There's usually an anti-emetic, so should you be uh, one of these drugs make you nauseated, you have something in your system already. So we're anticipating every limb of the pain management system ahead of time. Knee replacements have tripled since 1993. Yes. And that number is continuing to rise. I, there's a trend towards younger and younger patients having these types of surgeries. Why is that and how does that impact their outcomes? The biggest and most obvious factor is weight. Our entire society is overweight by and large and our government's last response to that was actually to increase the uh, cutting point for when you move from overweight to obese. So, um, you know, we've not done much to change that in our society. Um, second is how people tolerate pain. The 90-year-olds uh, the, the, the uh, handle pain very well. That's how they got to be 90 years old. Right. 
the baby boomers less well. And uh, so a lot of it's people's um, uh, pain tolerance. There's a Nobel Prize out there for whoever figures out why certain people get arthritis in their 40s and 50s. Uh, you see clusters, you see families, but we don't know that yet. And it's a big problem because these people are still working. That's why a lot of them need bilateral knees because they can't be out of work twice and lose their job. And bilateral so, knees, you mean they're getting two, both two knees at done once. at the same time? Yeah. And are you doing that more and more often? Yes. If someone who's thinking about having a total knee replacement, what types of questions should they be asking their doctor and what types of preparation should they be doing themselves? Well, first they ought to lose some weight probably, <laughs> but that's the hardest thing to do. And only 19, and even those who do lose it, uh, only 19% keep it off. It's a lifestyle change. As far as the physician, it's a matter of, it's been shown in heart surgery and joint surgery and most of the surgical disciplines, the more you do, the better results you get and the fewer complications. So you have to balance the convenience of staying in your community hospital and having your family doctor look after you versus going to a strange bed in a, in a, at a joint center. Um, where it may be a little less personal, but the risk of a problem is much lower and the chance of a good outcome is much higher. All these years, all this focus on knees, why knees? For me? Yes. <laughs> I've done everything. I did bunions. I was a spine surgeon <laughs> for my first 10 years, which I hated. Um, but, and I did a huge number of hips for a while, but the hip is pretty simple. It's a ball and a socket, and I was convinced that it was reaching an asymptote as far as design. Knees are still, um, still in evolution. There's still a lot more opportunity to advance the art. So I thought if I wanted to have any legacy at all or make any mark aside from the people you taught and the people whose joints you made better, if you could find a way to make the knees better and make them such that a lot more surgeons could do them successfully, that was a greater challenge. So it was really, I mean, this is, like I said, the sixth knee that I've been involved in, and that's the fun of it, is to try and uh, make the, move the ball forward from where you got it. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Booth. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Heather.